Hi everyone. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to be part of the symposium. I'm Aleta and I'll be talking to you about my experiences with patient support. But first, a little bit about myself. I'm originally from South Africa and immigrated to New Zealand about four and a half years ago with my husband and two young children. I have a seven-year-old son and an almost five-year-old daughter. I studied nursing in South Africa and I've been a neonatal intensive care nurse for almost 10 years. After moving to New Zealand, I took a break from nursing to make sure everyone settled well and after about two and a half years, went back to working in NICU. After working for about seven months, I noticed some visual disturbances. Driving home after a night shift, I checked my blind spot to change lanes and realized I had no vision in my left periphery. I booked myself in for an eye exam at my local spec savers, and after some tests, I was told it was a tumor unless proven otherwise. I was quickly referred to the Wellington Eye Clinic, where I was examined and in turn referred to Greenland Clinic in Auckland. After numerous tests there, a choroidal melanoma was confirmed and I was told the best option was to remove my eye. At this point, things were happening so fast, I didn't even think about seeking support groups. I handpicked the people I told, which was basically my husband, my mum and sister and nine close girlfriends. I went into management mode. It was like this was happening to a patient rather than to myself. In Auckland, I was given an information brochure about ocular melanoma even before my diagnosis was confirmed and told there was a Facebook group I could join. It took me some time to join this group as I was still coming to terms with everything and joining a support group just made it that much more real. At the Wellington Eye Clinic, after my diagnosis was confirmed, a lovely nurse there gave me some printouts and a website I could visit. Unfortunately, these didn't answer many of the questions I had and they were mostly British information. When I asked my ophthalmologist about local support groups, he said there were none and suggested I start one. But at that point, the last thing I wanted to do, apart from losing my eye, was to start a support group when I felt like I was the one who needed to be supported. The Facebook group I initially joined was mostly US based. So it felt like most of the procedures were different than in New Zealand. Apart from some practical advice with regards to makeup and how to tell my kids, I couldn't really relate to anyone on the group. In June, the nurse from the eye clinic contacted me and asked if she could share my contact details with a new patient who would also need to have a nucleation done. I immediately said yes. Thinking back to how I felt in the early stages and not really having any support, I didn't want anyone else to feel that way. So she gave me a call and it was such a release. We shared experiences, we could share feelings and we knew the other person knew exactly what we were talking about. Don't get me wrong, I've shared my story before, but unless you've actually been there, you don't really know what a patient goes through. I think it was also through her that I found Susan's group for Australians and New Zealanders. Um, and that definitely changed things, knowing that there were local people who were going through the same thing. I joined that group and I could share experiences more freely and I've received immense support from that group. I feel like people think that now the surgery is over, the crisis is over. For me, this roller coaster never really stops. It's six monthly liver scans, annual eye checks, regular eye checks for my healthy eye, for my own peace of mind bumping into things or people on my blind side, stepping up or down when there is no step because my depth perception is off. These are the little things that all add up and you definitely need people around you who get it and who know that sometimes you just don't want to get out of bed. I found this quote that says, I think the hardest part of cancer treatment is at the end, when everyone assumes you're cured and you no longer need their help. You're in your weakest, most devastated state, plus you no longer have the mission you had when you started this journey, to kill the cancer. The cancer is toast, but so are you. And now, like a soldier at the end of war, you need help putting yourself back together. 
Only everyone has gone home since they assume the war has been won. For a long time, that's exactly how I felt. And that's why these support groups are so important. Every eye clinic and every doctor's office needs to be aware of every possible support group out there so that patients can get the best support right from the start. Other than that, my doctors and nurses were amazing. I specifically remember crying as I lay on the theater table, feeling like I was about to jump off a bridge and my deepest being going, don't do it. The anesthetic nurse held my hand, offered me a tissue and started talking to me about my kids, supporting me to the extent that she had to ask another nurse to get the supplies the anesthetist needed. A big thank you to Wellington Eye Clinic and Wellington Hospital's pre-op theater and recovery ward staff. With regards to living with one eye, it's all about adjustments. Like I said earlier, it's sometimes the small things that now become big things. I check myself in the mirror constantly, something I never used to do. I drive more carefully, but life goes on, albeit with a few more compromises. I give myself more grace and I've learned to be more patient with myself. But I still crochet, I still paint, and I still work. Cosmetically, it's absolutely amazing what can be done these days with regards to ocular prosthesis. After my nucleation, I wore an eye patch for about two months and then started seeing the ocularist. People who don't know my story don't even realize one eye is a prosthetic. And people who do know me often go, which eye is it again? Because they just can't tell. Coming from South Africa, where you either had private medical aid with access to specialists or fairly poor government care, uh, I was really pleasantly surprised about how the New Zealand health system worked for me, from diagnosis straight through to prosthesis. I saw doctors who were specialists in their field. I've had ultrasounds done that I didn't want, that I didn't have to wait months for. And up to date, it hasn't cost me anything except a half price eye exam at Specsavers and a small fee for my first liver ultrasound through a private company. But I do have this to say, when it comes to follow-up care, there's no standard protocol. It seems every doctor does their own thing. For me, it's six monthly liver scans and annual eye checks. For my friend, it's three monthly liver scans with liver function tests. In the US, patients get CT scans and MRIs. This is really confusing for patients, especially since we have international support groups. I would love for there to be some standardized protocol for follow-up care. When it comes to advocacy, I had to learn not to be afraid to share my story and that it might actually be exactly what someone else needed to hear. So if you're a patient, if you're a survivor, be brave, educate people, tell your story. I love the quote that says, one day you will tell your story of how you've overcome what you're going through now, and it will be part of someone else's survival guide. I'm honored to be a part of someone else's survival guide. Hi, my name is Kate Savage Vickery. And 10 weeks ago, I found out I was going to have to have my eye removed because of ocular melanoma. Eight weeks ago, they took it out. And about two weeks ago, I got a new one. And that's up to you now to figure out which one it is during my talk. When I was asked to talk today, I was, I was excited and very flattered to be asked. Um, I was a bit nervous because I haven't done my usual insta story on this journey so not everybody knows but mainly I was worried that my story wasn't remarkable enough to share I've been incredibly lucky in so many ways that I'll explain but what I'm going to do is try and tell my story but pull out some things that I think might be relevant to patients carers and doctors just to try and make it a little bit easier for the next person that has to go through this
So I went for my first eye checkup at about 18 on the high street and luckily the guy there was very on the ball, saw something he didn't like and sent me straight to Moorfields Eye Hospital where they diagnosed a displaced nevus. They injected me with yellow dye and told me to call my mum and get her to the hospital as quickly as possible. And so began my six monthly checkups for the last 30 years. Um, at 23, I'd been traveling, was back in London, but decided that Australia was where I wanted to be. I had the job, I had the place to stay. I was ready to go apart from the visa and then they told me that the melanoma had grown and I was going to have to have radiotherapy plant treatment. It wasn't the operation that worried me, it was the fact that if I ticked cancer on my Australian visa form they might not let me in. And so began a very stressful few months but I had the, the radioplant therapy, it did what it was supposed to do. Um, and the doctors and myself and the Australian government were all reassured that that was going to be the end of that chapter. So a big reason about why I felt kind of unqualified to speak, I suppose, is because I haven't really sweated the big stuff. I've been okay through it all. Don't get me wrong, I have a temper when my boys are driving me nuts. But um, through some big things that have happened over the last you know, few years of my life, I don't worry about the big stuff. I have no fear about operations. And also I've realized, don't worry about what might be. So I've been spared the scanxiety, as we call it, or the what if it's cancer of phone calls. I haven't had that. Um, so I can't begin to pretend to understand how people feel who are going through what I know can be an extremely stressful time. One lady on our Facebook group actually said she felt like she died on the day of the operation, and that is absolutely heartbreaking. So I can offer sympathy and empathy, but, and this is quite important for carers, I can't offer misplaced understanding or advice or grass is greener. Just if you want to talk, then we're here. So in August, I was at my routine checkup after 20 years. I hadn't even told my husband I was going, I don't think. I was lying in the chair with the drops in, running through my shopping list, um, waiting for the to see you next year. But then it was taking longer than usual. There was more clicking than I'm used to. And I heard, oh, hang on. Oh, that's not good. I've tried it from every angle. Um... We might lose the eye. Hot, wait there, I'll be back in a minute. And that's how I found out. And I sat there, it probably was a minute, felt like an hour, thinking, did he just say what I thought he said? And he did. So I went outside, I sat in the car, and what threw me was I couldn't call my husband. He's my best friend, he's who I would call. But I was so freaked out and no offence, patients, but grossed out about the whole thing. I was worried that he would be too. And what if he said it was fine, but it wasn't? And what if he didn't find me attractive anymore, but he felt bad about it? Or what if it freaked my little boy out? All of these things were going through my head. Of course, I did tell him, and he was amazing. But that was my first thought. So three days and about three minutes in the chair later, it was confirmed by a second opinion. I would have to have the eye removed, which we all agreed with having seen the scans. And I was asked if I had any questions and that stumped me because bear in mind, I had no idea. I don't remember anyone ever saying to me that if this happened again, I would lose my eye. I just thought I would lose my sight never crossed my mind that I would lose my eye so I hadn't looked into it I didn't know anyone who'd been through it we booked it in for two weeks later I'm pretty pragmatic let's get it done and then I was given this printout um it's a black and white photocopy with a staple in it that was going to give me all the information I needed to f navigate 
one of the biggest things happening or would ever happen in my life. So I flicked it open um, and I saw that picture and I put it down and I never wanted to look at that again. Um, it's not the doctor's fault. My doctors are amazing. But it's insane. The a chasm between how underwhelming this photocopy is to how overwhelming the information is that you're about to have your eye out and we need to close that gap. So as you do, I thought I'd go and have a chat to Dr. Google. Also, I wanted to see some information in colour. So I googled and this came up and I freaked out. I've never seen an eye removed and it looked as terrifying as I thought it probably would. And again, no offense, but if I thought it was this gross, what the hell was everyone else gonna think? So I'd ask this, this would be my first takeout, I think, is for the doctors. Please remember that although this is your day job, this is the biggest moment of our lives and not in a good way. Um, also, the fact that we have this problem doesn't mean we have any knowledge of how it works when things go wrong or that we're not squeamish about eyes. And three, the information you give us, it has to reflect its importance. Your knowledge of the process outside the operation would be awesome. And particularly the physical execution of what we're being given that is designed to educate us on one of the biggest things that will ever happen to us. So the next thing is, how do I tell people? Who do I tell? And I learned pretty quickly that people are a lot more comfortable talking about cancer than they are talking about eyes, eye operations, and definitely eyes being removed. Um, case in point, my sister-in-law was diagnosed with breast cancer around the same time. Much bigger than what I was going through, obviously. Um, and when I told people, though, they understood, they sympathised, they said the right things. Um, unfortunately, everybody knows somebody who's been through this awful, awful illness. When I told people about my eye, when my dad told people about my eye, they said, oh, right, so cancer. Hang on. In her eye? What do you mean? So what are they going to do? They're going to take the eye. Oh, they're going to take the eye out. What? And then most people would remember what their face was doing and try and cover it up pretty quick. And if that's the grown ups, how do you tell your kids? That's a really stressful part for lots of people. Again, as I say, I was so lucky that I was in a good headspace, but everyone was telling me not to tell my son, Kobe. Everything inside me was telling me I should. He's a smart cookie, too many people knew. So I did a load of research and it was the Cancer Council sheet about talking to kids that helped me. It's amazing and we need one <laughs> for us. Um, so I based my conversation on that. I sat him down, I was ready for whatever might come. I said, buddy, you know mummy's bad eye, the cancer's got worse so we're gonna have to have it removed. And he stopped me and he said, mum, that's totally fine. I've seen people with one eye before and it's fine. And I couldn't figure out what he was talking about. I was trying to picture, was it school? Does he know someone? I don't know anyone. So what is he talking about? He's, you know, Thor. You know, when we watched Avengers and Thor and Hela cut, took his eye out and then he put the patch on and then he looked even cooler with the patch. I was like, yes, buddy, yes, I do. And as I say, I was lucky enough that I was in the right state of mind to carry on this um, <laughs> way of dealing with it, with humour in our house, as we often do. So my little guy and I went online. We looked for patches so that I could look as cool as Thor. And as it was my birthday 10 days later, we promptly bought patches for everybody and had a big pirate birthday party for my birthday. So getting serious again, the biggest thing that freaked me out through this whole process was twilight sedation. 
I don't care about operations as long as I'm going to be knocked out. This twilight sedation makes no sense. If you haven't heard about it, if you're a civilian, doctors, we don't know what you're talking about. If so you'll say I'm not going to be knocked out during the operation where you're going to take my eye out of my head and you're going to reattach the nerves to something that you're putting back in there and I'm going to be awake and I'm going to be able to see all of this. You know, the <laughs> patience, rest assured, if you haven't had this done yet, it works, it's amazing. Apparently I was talking to the doctors, so there's some kind of amnesiac act and I can't remember anything. But we do need to find a better way to explain this because that was the one thing that had me really shaken on the way into the operation. So I went home. I was very lucky to have a husband and a little boy who didn't necessarily look after me, but they looked after everything else so that I could look after me. Um, it hurt. There was some blood. There was an enormous bandage that I tried different disguises when I when I was seeing people. But what's next and what's normal and where do I get patches and can I drive a car? You know, none of this stuff is things the doctor can give you a definitive opinion on. And they haven't been through it. And that's when I found the Facebook group, Ocumel, Australia and New Zealand, run by Susan Vine, who's already spoken today. And that is my absolute lifeline and many others I know as well. You can ask anything on there and someone on there will have been going through it, have been through it, know someone who's gone through it, or it's it's an amazing wealth of support and information. It seems to me, being quite new into this, that Susan Vine and her moderators seem to be carrying all this weight of the patients on her shoulders, which is incredible. I don't know how she does it, but I think we as doctors and past patients need to come together and figure out a way to make this process um, simpler, smoother, easier, so that the responsibility isn't lying on one amazing person. So I took my photocopy of an ocularist, um, but he was away for a month or so, and I didn't really want to wait that long. So I found someone near me, Kerry Wilson, who is amazing in Sydney. But they don't have websites, these guys, and that's, you know, how we find things out now nowadays. So, you know, prosthetic eyes, remember that Google search. Despite this, though, to be honest, I was doing pretty well managing my anxiety. Um, but the day at the ocularist, I was a bit nervous, kind of more through lack of knowledge than anything else, I think. But then on my second visit, we put in a kind of work in progress eye and the floodgates opened. I was ugly crying. And I didn't know why. Everyone had been telling me all day how exciting this day would be. Um, getting the eye was, you know, going to just be amazing. I agreed that I should feel like that. And I didn't know why I didn't. And it was hard. I think what it was, was that was the day that stuff got real for me. It seemed like the novelty of the patch, you know, was fun. It was a talking point. But this was real now. And a fake eye is a fake eye, it always. It can't be fixed or covered. It's never going to work properly. This is it now for life. And that was pretty confronting. So was I excited to go to my final fitting? No, not really. Um, this was the morning. I've never shown anyone this before, either in picture or in real life. I always wore a patch around people even at home with my son and my husband 99% of the time. So that's pretty confronting, but this is me. But was I excited when I put the eye in that Kerry is 99% happy with and I looked in the mirror? Hell yeah, it was me. I was back. The skill involved in these things is mind-blowing. I'll be honest, the fitting and getting it in and out still totally grossed me out. But I came outside and I was buzzing. I was with my husband. We ordered a glass of wine and we sent this photo out to all our families and friends. And to be honest, half the people thought I was sending them a picture of having my hair done. So 
what happens now? I will try not to keep scrunching my face to hide it. I'll try and remember to move my head and not just my eyes. And I'm not going to let it stop me doing anything. But will my friends really forget about it? Will strangers notice? Will my son stop looking at me strangely and then trying to hide it? I don't know, but we'll see how we go and I'll let you know next year. But in the meantime, as I said, I wanted to pull out a few things. Doctors, please deliver the information with the clarity and gravity that it deserves. Carers, in my opinion, don't try and make us feel better about the situation. The situation sucks, but help us feel better about everything else so we can just deal with what we're dealing with. So empathy, not advice, I guess. But also really importantly is to look after yourself. Sometimes it's even harder to be the carer than the patient. You need your time, your space, whatever it is, however you relax and deal with things, make sure you're doing that at the same time. Otherwise, you won't be able to care because you won't have cared for yourself. And then patience. Hi, guys. The main thing I think for us is have family and friends around you and you need two types. You need the practical ones who are going to bring you dinner and pick your kids up from school and you need the emotional ones who are going to let you say how you really feel without judgment. And then get on Facebook. If you don't have a Facebook account, get one because we're all on there. Somebody on there will understand what you're going through. Even if they don't understand, they'll sympathize and empathize and have some idea. It's an amazing place to be. So jump online and Susan and the rest of us Omies will do everything we can to help you through this. Thank you for listening.